Let us pray this morning. Really, Father God, I thank you for the day. I thank you just for the opportunity to be here to share from your word. And you know, let us pray, God, that you speak to me. Let this be your message, Father. I don't want it to be mine, Father. Father, I pray just for giving the sins that may be in, in the way of this message, Father. Lord, just uh, it comes in and pray, Father, this morning. In the Son's name we pray. Amen. Give your Bibles there in Titus chapter 2, verse 11 and verses 14. It says, For the grace of God that brings salvation has appeared to all men. It teaches us to say no to ungodliness and worldly passions and to live self-controlled, upright, and godly lives in the present age. While we wait for the blessed hope, the glorious appearing of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ, who gave Himself for us to redeem us, from all wickedness and to purify for himself the people that are his very own, eager to do what is good. Just a little bit of background information. The letter of Titus is written by Paul to Titus. Titus was a young uh, pastor. It's believed that at some point in Titus's life that Paul actually was the one who led him to the Lord. Paul, uh, Titus was more than just an understudy to Paul. Uh, in, in 2 Corinthians, Paul refers to Titus as, as a, a fellow uh, partner and worker in the ministry. He really valued Titus. He invested his life in Titus, and Titus was ministering in Crete at the time. This is really an evangelistic letter. As we look at the context, we discover that in the first chapter, Paul is, is writing to Thomas, 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 to Titus, I send this to lesson on Thomas. And so, he was writing to Titus, and in the first chapter, uh, he's telling about the qualifications of an elder. Beginning in chapter 2, he starts talking about duty, responsibility of those who call themselves believers in Jesus Christ. More specifically, in verses 6 through 10, he begins to talk about the responsibility of elders uh, in investing in, in, in teaching the youngers in the church. It is as if he just kind of changes complete course. He goes from duty and begins to talk about doctrine in verse 11. What we find in this, in this whole passage that we just read is three times Paul talks about salvation. He speaks about salvation in the past, the present, and the future. If you notice there in verse 11, he said, For the grace of God that brings salvation has appeared. We can all look at our lives at some point. We put our faith in Jesus Christ and look into the past, and that salvation really appeared. And our eyes opened up to the saving grace of Jesus Christ. In verse 12, he says, It teaches us. And to emphasize it even more, you know that verse, he says, In this present age, he's talking about salvation as an active, living moment in the believer's life. It's not over yet because then in verse 13, it says, Why we wait for that blessed hope? It's very fitting because our theme for vacation Bible school is that God is the same today, tomorrow, and forever. You see, Paul is really telling us the same thing. For our salvation under Jesus Christ, because of the grace of God, it knows no boundaries. It's an everlasting message that extends to all people in all times. The truth of God is not bound by time, but rather the grace of God alone. Is limitless. It has always been, and it always will be. Verse 11 says, The grace of God is Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ came to bring salvation. Salvation is the safety, the deliverance from evil. Salvation comes only by God. It begins on earth, but God's completion at death for the cross to come. Salvation is the day to my Lord and forever. You notice in verse 11, he says, Salvation was for all men. Yeah. Jesus' sacrifice was sufficient for all people in all times. Even though some choose not to follow him, his sacrifice was for them. The reason I want to emphasize that is because when Paul goes from talking about duty and begins to talk about that to him, He's talking to the good people. While this is an evangelistic letter, what he's telling Titus is that Titus to share with the people in this church is that your life, you ought to live out loud. You ought to be so transformed by the power and saving grace of Jesus Christ that everyone around you sees something different in you. I do that's why Paul talks about salvation being so important. That's why he emphasizes it three times. 
He's got us a very basic nature. He's not speaking to the weakers. And so in this room this morning, if you don't know Jesus Christ as Lord, it may be a little difficult to really understand what happens next. Did you see when we accept Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior, we're filled with the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit, one of His ministries is to give us understanding. That way when you open up the Word of God, if you look into its pages, we understand what God is trying to teach us. And when you do know Jesus Christ, this message is definitely for you. If I was speaking to you and speaking to me, starting in verse 12, he says, It teaches us to say no to unbodiness and word of passion, and to live self control, upright, and godly lives in this present age. I want you to understand that God is not trying to reform this world. He's redeeming men and women who accept Jesus Christ. The first glance, we look at this verse, and, and several weeks ago, I, I was resuming the devotion. I came across this passage, and I read it you know, two, three, four days in a row because I knew there had to be something more. And the first glance, I looked at it, and I thought, maybe this is a list of requirements. Maybe what, it, what Paul's trying to say is, first of all, I need to say no to ungodliness. And then I need to live a self-controlled life, an upright, and live a double life. And if I can do one, and I can do the second, and so forth. But what I discovered when the further study is that this is not a step study. It is not a, a list, a checklist of things to accomplish. And that is a code of conduct. Two of my favorite words in all the scripture are the words and, and the word but. Because it completely changes everything. And speak language, the word and is in third here. And what he tells us is it's not, we don't do one, two, three, four, and five. But rather, we do one, rather than doing number two. I'm saying no to indictments. Why I'm saying no to other passions. Why are we living a self controlled life at the same time? So forth and so forth. And so I really want to spend the time of the time this morning looking at this particular passage and what is it that Paul is trying to teach us. In verse 12, he says, Say no to ungodliness. In its Greek translation, the word is actually deny. He is telling us to deny ungodliness. When we deny something, we are making a conscious decision to turn away from it. So I'm on a diet, and I go to McDonald's. I look at that number one Big Mac meal and all, man. I think to myself, yeah, I mean, I'm in there, right? And I see that number one, and I go, man, I don't want a Big Mac. I go, man, I've got to get my personal training today. I'm going to tell them what I eat. And I say, no, I made a conscious decision not to eat a Big Mac. I went to my wedding and did that now. Okay. So, when we deny unbalance, we are making a conscious decision to turn away. Turn away from something. But from what? Unbalance. Unbalance is also translated as irreverence. Or impiety, uh, in, in, in general impiety. Uh, in other words, impiety to be impious is to lack reverence or proper respect. So, what Paul is saying is when you deny unbalance, you are turning away from that which is irreverential. And you are saying yes to show proper reverence and respect to God. I say that again. When we deny ungodliness, it's a conscious decision to say no to the irreverential and yes to show proper love and respect and reverence to God. So how do we do that? Oftentimes when I'm studying God's Word, I just kind of keep a notebook with me and I'm sorry I'm asking questions. I don't know everything. A friend of mine told me, there's a pastor friend who says, a smart but a good student is not someone who knows everything, but someone who knows where to find everything. And in this day and age, most people look at Google. But it's, uh, it's uh, sometimes I do the fun stuff, but when it comes to God's Word, I've been mean, blessed with some great references. And then one reference is there's a well known pastor, a children's pastor, and he has a ministry called Life in a Kid's World. In this ministry, one of his articles, he's writing to his children, and he's telling them, how do you show respect to God? He gives them a list. And as I was reading that list, I thought, you know what, this is great, not just for kids, but for people of all ages. He says, really, if you want to show reverence and, and to God, the, the loving respect to him, 
Christ to us is read the Bible. Pray. Be kind to others. Listen to people in charge. Show respect with your actions. Say kind words to everyone. Take care of the creation. Always tell the truth. And put other people before yourself. I'm feeling is that. When I say no to him dying, as I'm saying yes to make a conscious decision to say yes to God, to love and respect him, to love and respect his creation, to love and love the trees and the fields and the mountains of the people he created, to love and honor him. And not only we to do not only the animals, but also to do not only the their passions. So the world of passion are those things that the secular world really attracts us. The things that from the inside out we, we are tempted, we get into our yearning, we say, well, what about that? It could be over indulgence. It could be money. It could be how easy it is sometimes just to lie ourselves out of the situation. There was a young banker. He was driving his BMW in the mountains, and he was driving during a snowstorm. As he was coming around a curve, he started to lose control. His car, his car started to skid towards the cliff. And just as the car was about to go off the cliff, he unbuckled his seatbelt, he jumped out of the car, just in time to land on the cliff himself, but his arm got stuck, stuck in the hinge of the car and tore it off from the shoulder down. The whole time, as this is happening, there's a trucker nearby, and he sees it, he pulls up, he stops, and he pulls up to the accident, and he looks down at this ledge, and he sees this man in shock, leaning over the edge, yelling, My BMW! My BMW! Trucker walks up to the man, and he says, Sir, he points to his arm and says, I think you have bigger problems than your BMW. The banker looks down and notices I'm as soon as he starts yelling, My Rolex! My Rolex! <laughs> you see, the pull of the world it can easily steal our affections away. It can cause us to live for the wrong things. So it's not bad. It's not bad to have money. It's not evil to have possessions, money, it's probably even a Rolex. The important thing is that attitude toward that stuff in our life. So the big idea that Paul is saying is that we have to have a deep respect for God and put nothing else before Him. So he's talking to believers. He said to you and he said to me, Do it right. God knows everything else after. Well, then, he tells us this. He says to live self-controlled. I love what the, the New American Standard says. It says, live sensibly. See, the Christian who lives sensibly has control over the issues of the life. The word sensibly can also be translated as the word soberly. It means that we, have, we must exercise restraint. We must exercise self, self-control in our passions, our propensities, that we're not to allow any substance or any activity or where these cravings overcome our lives. But we never allow the Spirit to control us. A sensible believer does not allow circumstances or the irresponsible influence of others to distract him or affect his judgment. So if you look at this, look at the context of what Paul is saying. He's teaching us that, you know what, as a believer, have God first. Revere Him. Respect Him with your life. This is be self-control. He's talking about the inside out. He's talking about the heart. He's talking about the saving power of Jesus Christ and how we should be completely changed because of it. You know, we should be able to look at that our writings and say, before I knew Christ, I was drastically different. But if we look at our past and say, well, there's nothing really different. I'm living the exact same way I was 10 years ago before I knew Christ. I'm living the same way today. There's something missing. There's something wrong. But the Spirit control our lives. He's talking about the responsibility to ourselves that we have because of the saving power of Jesus Christ. So remember, this is an evangelistic letter. So not only is there responsibility to ourselves, but also, we discover, because of our changed life, 
and the responsibility to those around us. He says to live righteously, or to live upright, or with right conduct, faithfully obeying the Word of God, the divine standard of what is right, without reservation. See, righteousness here refers to this uh, proper performance of our duties to fellow men. This would include being faithful in our relationships, our business contracts, uh, honoring our employers, our expectations, taking care of those in need, or loving our neighbors without prejudice. You see, this type of upright living is what people who don't know Christ will notice. If you can think of someone growing up that had this great heart for God, I can feel the faith. If you think of that person, everybody here probably has one person in mind ready to help them. They agree with me that they're going to measure up to God's word. I'm sure they may have made mistakes here or there, but man, they always sat after the soul of the Lord. They wanted to do what was right. They were honest. Even when it was difficult. There's a commercial about sportsmanship. And it's emerging to high school basketball championship game. Teams winning, they won, you know, they won basketball at one point. And um, times are also expanding. All of it's not that of bounds. They're always called up against the wrong team. So that goes into a game. If you take possession of the ball, they're going to win the game. The kid steps up to his coach, his coach is on the win. That's really well about it. But the championship on the way, the same man steps forward and says, This isn't right. So the way we have an effective way of having to live righteously. And then people take a notice. And we don't do it as they go, look at me, look what I can do. I'm going to do everything right today. We do it naturally because of the saving power of Jesus Christ within us. That's why we have to be self control. So we have a responsibility to others. And living righteously connects with our changed relationship towards them. And if people say you're not saying. But then he tells us this. He says, live a God way. King James, and even though you're not being a sister, live a God way. And you're living says, live with a devotion to God. See, so God way is Paul's term for genuine Christianity. When you are truly living a life, pleasing and honor to God, you therefore the word God means we have to have a close fellowship with God. We refer to our responsibilities into Him. We have to do that in our actions. Understand that in all things, we have to acknowledge His work in our lives. So Paul gives us this list that at first glance we think if I do A, I can do B, and therefore I can accomplish C. And if I do all these things, I'll be living God. Right? But I want to live more than this. We discover that we have to do all these things simultaneously. Second orange. You forget the orange. Now we're going to do two purely over the layers of the orange. The, 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 the I see the peeling, and then we have the pulp, and we have all the way over the you know, the great sweetness of the orange. And there's so many different elements. But in my hand, it's what? It's still an orange. And there's so many layers to the Christian life, to the genuine uh, Christianity, to the live a Bible life. We need to many layers, we need to do them all at once. They all hear these changes individually, collectively. They give this distinct evidence in the present age of our spiritual people. They are living, they are powerful testimonies within the church and before the world of the saving power of Jesus Christ. But look in verse 15 with me. It says, While we wait for the blessed hope, see, we're to be doing all these things today while we are waiting. 
And blessed hope is the glorious appearing of our great God and Savior Jesus Christ, who gave himself for us to redeem us from all wickedness and to purify for himself a people that is very own, eager to do what is good. Why are you living in life? It is to be a reflection of God's love for us. We are to be eagerly and anxiously awaiting the return of Jesus Christ. I think sometimes we lose sight of that. We may use those words to encourage you, oh, when Christ returns. But seriously, when Christ returns, we are to be living a life before God that is pleasing to Him. So if you think Jesus has provided a redemption that has the ability to drastically change our lives, the answer to that. There's some really key words to them. The word redeem that he uses. We hear that word today and we think, oh yeah, redeemed, or you know, we think of some, you know, uh, some great Christian songs and my redeemer lives and these things. But in the context, in this time in history, it was a huge word to use. See, so slavery was very popular at this time. It was very common practice. So when a slave was redeemed, what that meant was somebody came and literally paid the woman for their freedom. Therefore, they were redeemed. See, we were damaged to sin. But Jesus' resurrection, his life, his death, and his resurrection, confirmed has redeemed us, has brought us out of slavery to sin. The other word he uses is a word for the thing. The father is on. It's the great term for father is on. It means to cleanse, to make free from the admixture. The admixture is a combination of two or more chemicals. And the more we begin to study this, the more we begin to put the really, really down into the word of God. The really of the kind. So you know how to order them. They look so good. I love the Lord and say, man, she's precious. She's not going to backtalk to me. She's not going to smack me. And she's just, she's perfect. So this is the way that is right. But in time, she has that little thing that's so much. One time, she starts to get an eye on and we'll have some issues in the room. I look at her now and say, she's so clean, she says, perfect. What she looks over there? She's in a great facility of mixture of worldliness. And sin will be in her life. And what was so pure and righteous in her eyes will eventually become dirty. And I can see that purity. I have experienced it so far. This is how I look at us. We have this sin, this wilderness, this guiltiness, these things that we do, but we get so involved in. And he looks at us and says, Man, it's so hard. Jesus' blood it washed away the others and fears, and it made us right before God. It purified us. It took what this was so pure in our eyes. But soon we can fulfill Jesus has been washed it away. We need to pray again. And I see so much hope in that. And then it just opens my eyes to the perfect saving power of Jesus Christ. So here's the big idea. Is that Jesus is sacrificed. It comes to us from within. It made that wickedness in the past. It made us righteous in the eyes of God. And when that happens, when we fully grasp, grasp that and understand, we should have an eagerness to serve Him. Who wouldn't want to serve a God who saved us from the grips of hell? 
that's what I'm saying to us. Let the church know that Jesus saved them today, tomorrow, and forever. And when that transformation genuinely, truly takes effect in your life, you will be eager to do what is good. See, here's the thing about good deeds. Good deeds are not tasks that we accomplish in order to please God. Good deeds are not something that we do to earn His love. Good deeds are simply a byproduct of our faith. Because we love Him so genuinely. Because we want to serve Him so passionately. Good deeds. The fruit of the Spirit. And share with us in our lives. And keep doing with us. So in this passage, we, we get interrupted in these good deeds and we probably begin to talk about that again. Verse 15, he says, These are other things you should teach. <laughs> Encourage and agree with all authority. Do not let anyone despise you. We are to live our lives according to the word of God in a way that just makes an impact on the people around us. Will Rogers, a good food and food to share today. His name is American Cowboy and Christian Picture Actor from the 1920s and 30s. He said this. He said, Live your life in a way that you wouldn't be afraid to say the parent to the town gossip. So Jesus Christ came from us. He made the perfect life from us. He ran away. He ran away. He ran away. He ran away. And Jesus is on the cross. It says that he gave up the spirit. He means he means he sacrificed himself. He wasn't by the hands of men that Jesus Christ died. He was by his own, by God's will, and his own sacrifice. He willingly did that for you and for me. That's just a very amazing pleasure. It was just for a moment. I'm going to share just a couple of things very quickly. Just a chance just to reflect on that in God's Word today. But if there's someone in this room who really doesn't know what I'm talking about when it comes to knowing Jesus Christ as a Lord and Savior, I want to make it very simple for you. So Jesus Christ was born of the Virgin Mary. He lived, lived a perfect life. He sacrificed his life. And then, to top it all off, he defeated death. He rose again on the third day. God's Word says, by faith, by believing in your heart, and confessing with your mouth that Jesus is Lord, and you will be saved. It's also give you an opportunity. If there's someone in this room here who is not, who does not know the Lord, I just want to share a simple prayer with you. If you need to go to say in your heart, it's not the prayer that saved you, it's the faith in your heart. So you can simply say, Jesus, I know that I'm a sinner, I know that I deserve hell. I guess every day that you seek your son Jesus to die for me, that he rose with him, he defeated that. And I'm believing in him, Father. And I have this promise of eternity with you. Amen. Again, the Lord's always a nice prayer. I hope that they have nice prayers. If anyone wants to pray, no one will be mad. You just raise your hand so I can pray for you. I don't want to punch you. I don't want to call you by name. This one, no, I can pray for you. I really thought about it. Thank you so much for everyone who's here today. Thank you for the opportunity to share from the Lord. You are so good and so gracious. You provide a good grace of balance. So, so much. So much more than you can ever have. God, you are good and you are great. 
for the way that God wants to continue to watch over us today and do the more things that we do for the day and the year. As we go out, I pray that we're challenged to live our life in a way that is honored and pleasing to you about our lives, but the way that we live the self-control and the heart and God with our lives. Not when we are wrong, Father, correct us. Our sins are in any corner.